Okay, happy day. Uh, we are talking about emotional re resilience and really the nervous system. So the language of today has been the nervous system. Many people are starting to discover the nervous system. It's not something that has been talked about a whole lot, but we know innately that the nervous system is controlling every single cell, every single organ inside of the body, but how that nervous system operates is really kind of unfolding uh, amongst us and amongst science. And when I say it's unfolding, it has been being discovered all along. And if you know anything about science, it takes about 15 to 30 years for it to become public knowledge and to become accepted. So this work has been around for a long time. Uh, and for chiropractors, a hundred and 25 years, maybe more than that. Now working and knowing that the nervous system gets stuck and the state of the body is a reflection of the state of the nervous system. So stress inside of the nervous system shows up as symptoms. Stress in the nervous system for our kids during development shows up as them getting stuck emotionally, getting stuck viscerally. So in the body with the organs and the glands and the digestive system and the immune system, it shows up hormonally with reproduction or just the way that the body is feeling. And then it also shows up emotionally and it shows up in the motor system. It shows up in their ability to move their body, to learn, to be able to do what we call self-regulate. Um, and what we're going to start to learn about today is more how the nervous system regulates and what that looks like and how the state of the nervous system shows up in a form of symptoms. And often we can package those symptoms together in a nice little box and call it something, right? We can give it a diagnosis and say, the body's following these amount of behaviors and they're showing these si si signs and symptoms. And therefore you have this, whatever it is, X, Y, Z. And chiropractors really take that information, especially neurological based chiropractors. Now, I guess I have to go back and preface with chiropractors is that they're musculoskeletal chiropractors and they're great at dealing with pain and auto accidents and falls and injuries and, um, you know, whiplash and things like that. And the neurobased chiropractors are focused on the nervous system. Now, neurological and kid focused, when we are pediatric focused, we're looking at neurological development. We're looking at where that nervous system gets stuck. We're measuring the stress. We're monitoring it. We're watching the changes. And then we watch the body unfold and self heal, which is the way that it is designed. Science always likes to look at the brain and say like, why is the brain reacting this way? Well, the brain's getting its information from somewhere, right? It's getting it from the body. It's getting it from the nervous system. And if we just cut the body off and just examine the head, we could, I'm sure, find ways that the brain is lighting up or finding errors in the system, but we have to know the operating system beneath is where it's getting its information and it can really only make the best decisions when, with the information that it's been given. So let's kind of explore that nervous system and how it influences the brain and how it influences the body. I've got some slides. Well, it's not really a slide. I was, I would say it's a, it's a more of a poster or a whiteboard that um, I like to look at or use. I guess I should have had this already um, queued up and I apologize for that. This is our meeting information. Aren't you excited to see that? Uh, let me move this over. All right. So um, I've got a couple different, you know, flyers that I have that I'd like to explain the nervous system with. And I'm just going to go over those with you and really start to understand uh, that once again, the nervous system, how it gets stuck what adaptability looks like, what symptoms look like. And if you're new to the nervous system, you might be like, whoa, lady, I don't even know what you're talking about, right? Like, I, there are some people that come from really just Western medicine, examining symptoms and, and the, I'm not, I can't even thinking, theorizing that um, we're a little, we're kind of just like victims of our circumstances, right? Like it just happens, you know, my mom is constipated and I'm constipated. My daughter is constipated. Where's me constipated our whole lives, right? My mom's, you know, has anxiety anxiety, it just, and on and on. And yes, there's ancestral stress that gets passed down. I, I can talk about that a little bit later and how that works and how the studies have found that. Absolutely. Is there genetics that play into it? Sure. When you start to look at epigenetics and what turns on genes, uh, we start to really see different things unfold because the environment is turning it on. So when we're looking at the nervous system, it is constantly surveying its environment. It's called neuroception. Your nervous system is looking for signs of safety inside, outside, and between. So inside yourself, how does my body feel? Is it in a state of stress or tension? 
How's my heart rate? How's my viscera? Now we might not cognitively be feeling this. We have to know that 80% of this is, comes from the body and we like to disassociate from this, but we can talk about that later. Um, this subconscious brain is picking up on this. We can't consciously think about danger. And I kind of want to go into that further as well. But it is looking inside. It is looking outside in its environment. Am I safe where I'm at? And between, between you and other nervous systems. And that's a little bit of that instinctual thing too, as well. You know, we'd like to override that, that process quite frequently. Um, but really when you know, you know, your nervous system knows, especially a child knows, am I safe between these nervous systems? You can approach someone on the street and you can look at the state of their body and know whether or not you want to approach that nervous system. That is an instinctual response. And that is a response inside their, your body. If you start seeing somebody in your body, it's tense, it's warning you, it's racing, but yet your thinking brain says, oh, I don't want to hurt their feelings, right? I don't want to approach them. I'm just still going to kind of say hi, but your body is saying run, right? G avoid, go the other way, flee, do not approach that person. That is an innate response and that's the way the nervous system works beneath the cortical surface. I'm going to talk about the way that their brain, our brain, de brains develop so you can understand that further as well and how those responses get stuck, but also how our thinking brain likes to overpower that. And, um, you know, be like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hurt the feelings. I don't want to feel, you know, it's rejection and, you know, you get it. Uh, okay. So our nervous system, as you know, is controlling every single cell inside of our body. And where the way that we used to look at the nervous system was in more a, of a mode of sympathetic and parasympathetic. You've heard me talk about this, I'm sure, a million times. If you haven't, you're welcome. Um, here I am again. Sympathetic nervous system is that state of stress that I just talked about, the tension in the body, the changes in the viscera, the muscle tightness within the body, that stress response, a tightness that starts to happen. Uh, and our parasympathetic nervous system actually has two roles and the rest and digest side of the nervous system, um, can take over, but also the calming side of your nervous system. So I'm going to look at that as far as uh, a ladder goes on this right hand side. Once again, I, I know that there's a lot of information on this page. So what I really just covered was it controlling everything and that's the operating system. It's a subcortical response, your hind brain, which we can talk about. That's the brain stem. Um, and the midbrain, those are all like hind, the hindbrain being more of the impulsive, the instinctual response. So they talk about it as like the reptilian brain. And then the midbrain is more, more being the mammalian brain. So, um, you know, if you want to talk about like animals in the wild, they're going to protect themselves, right? They don't have a cortical process to like think through and be like, well, I don't want to hurt this other person's feelings. No, they're going to protect their young. They're going to protect themselves. They're going to get out of the way and they're going to let go of that trauma. They don't, you know, trauma is not in the wild. Uh, but we can talk about trauma here as well. As you can see, I've got a couple of phrases about stress and trauma. And that's how really the nervous system gets stuck and overwhelmed and in states of stress and exhibiting symptoms, whether or not it feels emotional or not. So we have a lot of kids that come in because their immune system is not working well, or their digestive system isn't working well. They're like, well, it behave, you know, fine. Um, it's, you know, emotionally, but they do get frustrated or they do have meltdowns and isn't that a normal child? And yes, you know, it is a child should be able to climb up and down this ladder to be able to feel stressed, um, be, and be able to then also feel calm and organized and resilient. If we have this constant tension in the body under the surface tells us that there is tension within that the digestive tract should be able to digest its food. It should be able to handle its environment. And it's not typically that the environment is overwhelming. It's that we're unable to handle it because of the stress inside of the body. So this ladder over here, when you're, when you're first in, um, a calm state. So if you've heard of me talk about this before, your prefrontal cortex is engaged. So it's a front of your brain. I've done this analogy a lot of times for people, um, prefrontal cortex, which our kids are still developing. This says I'm safe. This says I'm calm. This says I can organize in my environment. I can goal set. I can move my body with ease. I can breathe with ease. I'm comfortable. I'm joyful. I'm present, creative, right? This is really helps us be empathetic with other people and see other people, uh, and when we are in that state, that is 
part of our parasympathetic nervous system. So there is two pieces. Once, once again, there's going to be a front and a back of our vagus nerve. And you've probably heard me talk about our vagus nerve before, um, but that's that super highway of information coming to and fro the body. It does a majority of the communication, not all of it. Um, and we don't need to get into those details, but that is the ventral or the front of that vagus nerve is really engaged when that happens. Now, when I start to nociception or nociception, nociception is tension and noise in the body. Neuroception say, okay, there's a threat. There's a threat inside. There's a threat outside, or there's a threat between me and another nervous system. We're going to drop into sympathetic, right? That's all the things I, I was listing off before fight or flight. We protect ourselves. We call this more mobilization. So there, there's movement in the body. There's an increase in heart rate. There's increase in tension. There's blood that's shunted out into the limbs. Um, you feel if you're stuck here, you feel a little bit more anxious and irritable, right? You're sensing this, this danger. This is when we say the prefrontal cortex disengages and the hind or that midbrain is taking over that amygdala says there's fear here. Now, this is an, a great response to have. We need to allow our body to work through that. There's a ton of chemicals that are being dumped throughout the body when we have this stress response. So those chemicals, cortisol, adrenaline, it's all pumping and coursing through the system. But what happens when we have a stress response and we stay stuck? We stay where we're at. Your chest is already getting tired talking about this and how this feels. We cannot utilize that energy. We're like, pushing it beneath the surface. So uh, this is like taking a beach ball and you're trying to push it under the water and you're creating a bunch of tension and energy because you're like, oh, just keep that down, right? This is a kid sitting in class and they're not supposed to move and they're supposed to listen and um, feel rested and, and pay attention, but they're getting anxious and they can't understand and there's things happening around them because their sensory systems turn up and their internal alarm is turned up and everything that's in that fight or flight is taking over and they're trying to hold it together and they start pushing things down. This is where we usually see that explosion when they get home and they feel safe in between your nervous system and their nervous system and in their home. But that doesn't feel really good to your nervous system, right? When your kid is having that meltdown, when they're not listening, when they're erupting emotionally, when they're not being rational or logical, and you know that their prefrontal cortex is offline and there's not reasoning with this. This is where we need to show them safety. We have to show the nervous system that it's safe. So if we meet this threat with threat, right? We, we're like, we're, we're like, we're upset because our nervous system just kind of went offline. And then we have this huge, you know, tension that happens in the home or maybe amongst siblings, amongst another parent. And then everybody's like dysregulated and they have a really hard time climbing back up to the top of the ladder. And instead what they start to do is drop to the bottom of the ladder. Still offline, we're in the dorsal or the backside of the vagus nerve now, where we feel disconnected, shut down, you know, immobilized. We don't have uh, a lot of, you know, association with our feelings at that time. This is where people will say like they're numb or um, they are lazy. Um, they they don't have the motivation that they need to do things. And, and what happens will to, to cycle through this or to get out of this bottom of the ladder response, we need to climb into sympathetic. Well, if you take that beach ball analogy where I said like pushed all that down, that energy still needs to be released. There is still cortisol and adrenaline coursing through our system, but we've shut that down. This is when we are toxic with emotional stress. So we already know about emotional toxins or, or sorry, um, chemical toxins where we can get overwhelmed with the chemicals of the environment and what's in the air and the food we eat and the drinking water. You know, we are, we can already recognize in this world that toxins are overwhelming to the system and they can build up. We kind of get that. Um, we don't think about the emotional toxins that start to build up with the cortisol and adrenaline inside of the system that hasn't been metabolized. There's a lot of energy under the surface of this um, stress response where your life is not feeling threatened because you need to just take care of organ and gland function and you don't have that energy to move and to mobilize. You need to get moving again. So you're going to climb up the ladder. We aren't going to hop from here to here. So the body will start to feel that heat again and that movement 
And there's ways to allow this to happen in a safe sp space. So um, during play, right? During, if you can get this child moving, playing, get it out of their body, don't let them sit there. Um, here, here's another really good, um, let me give you a really good example of dorsal vagal tone is in video games. So we're acting like we're engaged, right? We're here, there's stress, there's things going on. What is happening to all those stress hormones in the body? They're being pushed beneath the surface. And a lot of the times kids are really obsessed with like uh, videos and, and gaming. They, uh, they often be like, oh man, they're so lazy. They don't move their body and their muscles. Yes, they don't. They are bottling up that tension, but then not allowing that feeling or they're so involved in their brain and what's going on. And they're pushing all that tension down to not feel it and starting to disassociate and numb the nervous system. And this, once again, will show up as symptoms. It shows up in not only lethargy in their attitude, but also likely in school, in their motor function, learning, in their social life, in their way that they feel about themselves, in their self-talk. Getting their body moving again is going to be key. We have to get back up this ladder into sympathetic, even though it feels like protection, even though there's heat and there's movement inside of the body, we need to be okay with that feeling. We need to allow the body to metabolize those, those hormones before we can get up into this ventral state. Now, uh, many of you who are under care in the practice, you know that the adjustments are triggering that prefrontal cortex or putting that lid back down. They're sinking the right and left sides of the brain together, which we'll talk about why that's important in a little bit to prepare the right and left side of the brain to communicate. The body is able the, to connect with the brain. The brain understands what's going on beneath the surface. That's why sometimes after adjustments, people can feel emotional. Some people can feel energized. That's the body reconnecting and being able to take care of what's beneath the surface. And I'm going to keep calling them toxins, right? Like it's the same th thing with um, stress in the bodies and that protective response in the viscera or, or the internal organs and glands aren't digesting nutrients. The immune system has been shifted and shut down except for inflammation that turns up under stress uh, because you might get wounded when you're in fight or flight. Um, the body is sustained there in that operation. Um, that's where they're stuck as well. So they might start having bigger bowel movements. They might start having an immune response. Maybe they get a fever or runny nose. The body's taking care of what's beneath the surface now, or the brain is able to take care of that and say, oh, this is what we need to do. So chiropractors call those stuck states a subluxation. Um, and that subluxation really is um, something that happens within the body. That's, here's the states of stress that it, the ways that it can come. Um, too much, too fast, too soon, too not enough, or too little. And I am talking about the three forms of stress. I'm going to move from this up to the top here. Um, when you're looking at the three forms of stress, physical, um, chemical, and emotional, they all can be toxins. Okay. But we call emotional stress, those thought toxins, trauma, the physical, um, stress inside the body, which I'll kind of show you here in a little bit and how that plays into our children and their feeling of safety or their neuroception of safety. And then toxins, like I've already mentioned several times when there's too much, too overwhelming, too fast for the body to handle, it can feel and get stuck in that state of stress. And we feel it in the nervous system. We feel it where the body starts reacting. And that's part of that subluxation complex that we see um, through here. And that's what we're measuring on the scans. We're measuring the tension in the muscles. How do we feel at rest, right? Those scans are taken at rest of the nervous system. So I'm seated at rest. Why is there tension in my muscles that I'm not able to relax? Then once again, this is a subconscious. This is not less being like, Oh, I should relax. Um, yes. There's times where we're like, I am safe. I can cognitively tell my body I am safe. My brain says you're safe. Everything's fine the body doesn't feel safe. There's tension underneath the surface. Subconsciously, it's still fighting a stress response that's still living in there that it needs to let go of. So the um, 
thermal scans are looking at the visceral changes within the body where we're shunting the blood either internally or externally within the system. The HRV is looking at heart rate variability, variability changes. The heart rate needs to keep up with what's happening. We're going to see those heart rhythm changes. And if we can't get out of that stress response cycle, um, if we can't allow the body to release that, we're going to stay in this perpetual cycle of stress. Once again, showing in up as, and kicking off symptoms, digestive changes, immune changes, then pain starts to come, right? Like people that have chronic um, pain or fibromyalgia, um, we're going to start seeing it show up in anxiety and depression because we're oscillating between the middle and the bottom of this ladder where we're unable to climb out because once we start to feel that sense of stress, we don't like it, we're not comfortable, we push it back down and then we're back in here. So um, what we end up doing is getting these adaptive responses over time where that threat or the protective me mechanism is experienced either in a short lived or it's chronically lived there. We can That can happen in both. And sometimes we don't necessarily no, that's why we take a case history and really examine, okay, how's the body responding? What kind of symptoms are there? But then tell me your case history through what kind of physical stress was in the birth? What kind of emotional stress was in mom while she was pregnant? What was going, what's going on as far as chemical changes in the body or visceral and adaptive changes in the immune system? So just looking at where the stress has come, some really big overwhelming stressors in the life that in your life that will keep you stress in a stress state. Um, or, or was it something that was from inception that kept our body in that state of stress that keeps showing up in the body? So remember, um, stress isn't um, in the event it's found in the nervous system and it doesn't come back as a memory. It comes back as a reaction inside the body. So um, one of the biggest things that we do talk about is that birth trauma. But first, let me kind of go through some of the emotional responses that tend to happen. So the body can get into fight mode. So this is when we're defensive, we're explosive, we're irritable, angry, we have rage and frustration within the body. So the state of our nervous system, once again, is determining the state or the story that we're telling ourselves is happening, right? Our nervous system is perception. The function of the nervous system is to perceive our environment those neuroceptive cues and coordinate the behavior of every other cell. So neuroception is danger. We're going to organize it that way. If the danger doesn't leave and persists, we often stay there. we stay stuck there or we drop into the dorsal vagal tone. Um, and we can also go into states of shutdown, fawn or functional freeze. So um, just to go into flight a little bit, those are the people that like to stay busy, right? The nervous systems that are that are busy, they like to imagine a little too much escapism. They might be try to be perfect all the time. They might be workaholics where they just go, go, go. They have more anxiety, panic, and fear within them. Um, the shutdown. So when you're looking at someone that's a little bit, when we already said lazy, exhausted, numb, isolated, helpless, hopeless, and they feel experience a lot of shame and depression uh, within the body as well as fawn that are more people pleasing, agreeable, no boundaries. Um, they still live in fear and anxiety and security. This is a little bit more of a blended state of these two, as you could see. And then functional freeze is somebody that's muscling through life. So they look calm on the outside, internally uh, disassociating from their feelings. They're an autopilot and they're really emotionally uh, numb. We'll talk about a lot of those people, the left-brained um, humans, which we can chat about here in just a moment. Um, but these symptoms are are seriously just protective mechanisms within the body so that it can adapt to the stress that's there to remove the stress that is there to allow them to fit in emotionally often or in with, you know, the family unit or social crowd. And then over time, it's really maladaptive. It doesn't start to serve the body over time. Over time, if we're in this constant shutdown or people pleasing, or we have no boundaries, or we're really disassociated and heavy left brained with that, and we're more like just like logical and rational, and we refuse to connect to somebody else's emotions in that right brain side of the uh, of the nervous system, then we are going to see. Um, it starts to reflect in, you know, not only self-worth, but relationships and social and emotional statuses. So um, ultimately when patients are coming in, they can reflect any one of these. They can say, oh yeah, I go, you know, I go between sympathetic and, and parasympathetic um, shutdown mode and I don't feel connected and joyful very frequently. I don't feel like 
we climb to the top of the ladder for very long. We might touch the top and drop back down really, really quickly. We want to feel more of that. We want to feel more calm, creative, and organized. We want to be who God's created us to be. And that's the really important thing is our nervous systems are made to regulate. Regulation is climbing up and down and knowing it's okay to feel stress and climb back up to the top. It's okay to feel exhausted, right? This is like shutdown can be bedtime, right? Like, mm, need to go to rest and organs and glands need all the energy. And then we get back and we climb back out. And here we are waking up, hopefully in the top of the ladder, but we do have to arouse or, you know, cortisol is the highest in the morning should be the, those are the slow starters if they're not. So we can remobilize the body. And then we climb into this ventral state where, uh, and once again, you know, we don't even need to talk about like circadian rhythms and stuff. Cause there's some people that aren't morning people, right? They're like, <laughs> they're like still down here in the morning. Um, usually because they haven't allowed their body to rest where it should. And we've spent too much tension and stress here in the sympathetic nervous system before we can climb into ventral. Um, and then I've already mentioned about the adjustment. So patients that are here with, with us that are, that, um, do you get adjusted or you've been on a care plan, you're on a care plan or you're under lifestyle care, you know that those adjustments are allowing that the, the body to climb back up that ladder. But also what you might not realize is that it's also allowing the body to go through this ladder and feel okay with that, to feel heat and tension in the body and then let it go, right? Metabolize those, those um, symptoms and, and then also shut down at night and then once again, climb back up the ladder. I don't need to repeat myself a million times, but just knowing that God designed us to be that way. God's design is self-healing. It, it, we have a pharmacy inside of us. We have the tools inside of us. We have a body that was designed to self-heal and self-regulate. And the more we can work with that design, then the less we need to cover up symptoms, the less we need to have these, you know, extra tools to fix the body when the body does know how to fix itself. Now, don't get me wrong. I have really cool stuff that I like too, right? Like I got, I have a PMF mat and I like to soak in Epsom salts and I use essential oils and we eat an organic diet and we, we pay attention to the way that we work our work out with our body. And I'm pointing over here because this is my workout facility is right next to me. Um, we pay attention to how we move our body and we journal and, and, you know, we use outlets for our stress response because we are, our family in general is more of the like, go, 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 do, do, do. We like to move. We like to chase things. And that. I believe is part of healthy aggression as well. Now, you know, here's the, here's the thing that you also need to know is that we are always in process. We've never arrived to where we are. So you're talking to somebody in process, you're in process, I'm in process of learning the body and learning how it works and learning about the nervous system and learning about your individual nervous system and how it does react. So you do know what's going on and how you may typically respond to a stress and be able to be okay with the way that your response is in the moment. Now we talk about unhealthy aggression. We talk about that rage and that sympathetic nervous system that that wiring has become the go-to response. And that can happen in our kids quite frequently. So that's why I want to rewind at the top of this page here when we're talking about um, the way that the brain develops and how it starts to get interfered with. As I already mentioned, that hind brain or that impulsive brain that's there for us, that, that's instinctual. So at birth, we're mostly survival, right? In the utero, we're, we're in survival mode. Our sympathetic nervous system is what is primarily developing. Now, 32 weeks, you'll start to see organs and glands start to grow and the baby gains weight because that's more of the parasympathetic nervous system. And then as you know, that, that vagus nerve, if you heard me talk before, it's like starting to develop and really not being utilized fully until like age seven. So that's part of the regulation side of, of that vagus nerve as well. But our prefrontal cortex isn't developing till 28, um, 25 to 28 depending on male or female, and of course, life circumstances, but they're still developing their sense of the world and creativity. They're still mostly in that hind limb brain, not the limbic brain, but that survival mechanism. They are looking for safety. They are looking at, am I safe inside? Am I hungry? Do I have to go to the bathroom? What's my external environment feel like? Am I hot? Am I cold? What is the nervous system, the person holding me saying? 
Now, this is something, moms, that um, is also new to me. The more I've started to understand um, attachment and the research behind attachment and the research behind what our logical brain starts seeing and reasoning with based on how we're responded to as an infant. So um, say that your infant is crying and you don't know what they need. So you're anxious. You're trying to figure out what they want and their nervous system doesn't feel safe around your nervous system. You can already imagine this, right? Instinctual. It's like, oh my gosh, I now I'm more upset in this body, this tense that's holding me and they don't know what to do. And this is not a blame for mom, right? We're all new, new parents. We're all doing this for the first time. And we don't realize how our reactions and our nervous system is now um, making that baby feel. So Think about the, the moms that you, you might've felt a little disassociated after birth. Like your hormones were like, man, I had some postpartum. I wasn't able to be responsive to my baby. I wasn't able to fully feel like I could just like connect and love. I wasn't in ventral when I had this baby. My lid wasn't on. I felt like I was in the shutdown or I wasn't fight or flight. The baby is sensing that. And now they're like, okay, uh, you know, what I'm doing is not important, right? This is where they start to, um, get more of the avoidant attachment where they're, they're introception. They're looking inside for their themselves. They don't want to burden somebody else with their cries. And this might seem really dramatic. We're like, wow, it's just a baby. It is, it is just a baby. It is just in survival. It is their nervous system starting to develop of, are they safe? And what is, what is it? What, when they aren't feeling safe internally, what is the external, which is the primary caregiver to help them feel safe providing for them. And that's so important. So if you want to learn more about that, um, there's a ton on, uh, the attachment theory, you know, I'm trying to think of some of the books that I've read on it. There's probably about five or six. Um, I can share those or, or ask me here in the open Q and A and I'll go through my audible account to be able to look at that. Um, but really, really important um, to just understand where it potentially came from. And then I'm going to go back in time to in utero and in the womb. The baby cannot fight or flee in the womb. So you're getting your mother's nervous system. If mom is having overwhelming feelings of tension and anxiety, if there's something really major emotionally that happened during that pregnancy, and we hear this quite a bit in our office of death of a loved one, loss of a home, uh, you know, deployment, they were an ER nurse, they were a 911 operator, right? Their body's under this chronic stress that wasn't going away. Their body was constantly having tension and usually to the point of disassociation, right? If you're in this chronic state of stress over time where you're working with people that are constantly hurt, you will disassociate over time. That's often, I feel like when um, somebody is like, oh, I went to the medical doctor and they're just like, kind of didn't even care about me. Yes, they start to disassociate over time as their nervous system can't keep up with the overwhelming amount of pain that people are in in those hospital environments. So um, that's something that's kind of a natural response, even though we feel like we're like, oh, wow, that was really cool. I'm glad they did that to me. I mean, it can be traumatizing to the person there. And I've experienced that as well myself where I was like, dude, uh, anyway, you're like, I'm a human. Let's humanize this. Um, but the baby will so often be in shutdown before they're born because they can't run or flee. So if mom has had some really traumatic events, they're like, well, this baby was born really lethargic and doesn't, you know, have a lot of like care. And they're just, sometimes they're like, this is such an easy baby. They just sleep all the time. And you're like, Ooh, um, that's not necessarily great. Or they're just really stiff, right? Like I'm not floppy baby. They're like in constant sympathetic and fight or flight. Also not cool. And um, we want the baby to feel safe and loose and responsive and that they're being responded to. Um, by mom as well. So one thing that can keep the baby in fight or flight. So let's say mom had a great pregnancy. Everything was wonderful. Um, and then during the birth, the baby got stuck. They were trapped. Their cord was around the neck. We had to use a medication, forceps, C-section, something that, that pulled the baby out of the womb. That will damage the brainstem. The brainstem is the filtering center. So I talked about being the primitive survival brain, instinctual brain. That brainstem is what's doing, that hind brain is what's doing um, the majority of that filtering process. So this is supposed to be a filter, I guess. Um, funnel. <laughs> um, and it really is looking, the neuroception of safety, am I safe inside, outside, in, in between? Um, and as those emotions are coming up for that little one, so they feel this sensation inside of their body, they need help. 
um, right? They, they have emotion before they have language. So I'm not, and I'm talking about the middle part of our brain that really handles or that limbic system. You've probably heard of that with the amygdala and the hippocampus um, that are that are processing our emotions and how we're responding to those emotions or, or the, the um, logic we're putting to them. What meaning am I putting to this emotion based on how somebody else responded? And here's another thing that we need to realize when there is a blow up or we did something where we're like, wow, I just really went sympathetic on my kid and I need to go apologize. Um, apologizing goes a long way to them to let them know that that wasn't great. That wasn't, that wasn't the, how you wanted to show up. You didn't want to do that to show them that sense of safety because otherwise they're telling themselves it was them. And now they don't want to do that again they come more of that people pleasing side because they're like, oh man, that person exploded. I think it's me and I caused this instead of, a, it was the state of your nervous system um, over time. So in, and often with the attachment, dis, yeah, I'm gonna say disorder, the attachment styles um, and there's anxious avoidant, which you can kind of imagine what I was explaining before about like the anxious, you know, like uh, um, the avoidant where like, you know, they weren't there for me. And then the secure attachment, there's also ambivalent attachment. That's usually when the mom has got more trauma and the baby really starts to um, not be well with themselves as well. 40% um, of the time to 45% of the time, you guys is when you got to kind of get it right to connect with that one. So it's not like every single time, you know, man, I failed as a parent and our nervous system. So dysregulated. Now it's just regulated when they're born. And I always set this child up for failure. No, once again, the nervous system learns over time. The nervous system can also unlearn and relearn. That's the cool part of the body. It can start to learn different attachment styles. It can start to feel safer in its environment, internally, externally, and between other nervous systems, especially when the entire family is regulated. I keep checking the time here to make sure I'm not talking too long, but um, something I just want to touch on a little bit here, because I mentioned the right and the left side of the brain, um, the right side of the brain that does the, you know, creativity, it, imagination, intuition, it connects us to other nervous systems. There's, it's, a, there's no logic, linear time sequence to this. This is if we were all right brain, we just never make a decision and lollygag around the world and which we might be, you know, you might have a child that's like this, where like, why aren't, haven't you developed past this point? Or you have all the logical thinking where, it's just logic. It's linear. They don't get jokes that everything is this way. They don't recognize emotions. They don't recognize social cues. They're just so left brain and the two brains aren't integrating well. But, and usually it's because we're stuck further down the line, which would be that brain stem. The filtering center is off. And there's some kids that don't get past that instinctual brain, right? We've got kids that are very impulsive and reactive, um, but also some of them that are, that are nonverbal. Right. Like they, they really do just, they just kind of are, they, they understand and can see what's going on around them. It's all kind of trapped inside the brain. They don't have execution on um, developing this prefrontal cortex, which is next. And they really get stuck in that brain stem. And then, and then they have a feeling <clears throat> they don't know how to react to it. So they're just kind of like stemming or they're all over the place. Um, you can imagine that as well, but more of our kids that start to get um, emotionally stuck they can have this non-integrated brain from right to left, which can also start to interfere with other developmental cues as well. Excuse me. Because eventually we need to send this information up to this, to the cortex, to the learning center, to the, where we problem solve, where we empathize, where we recognize emotions, where more, we are more reflexible with our responses, where we're creative, right? Our lid is on. Um, we are aware of our emotions and a processing of our emotions. Um, the sensory system is not overwhelmed because the body feels safe, right? It's sending information, hopefully, to this prefrontal cortex and cortex of safety rather than constant fear and stress um, and overwhelming emotion. So if we're off in that brainstem and we're off in that middle brain, we're going to be off in this cortex and the way that they're learning and they're, they're what we call response flexibility, where they're, their ability to respond and to see somebody else in their point of view and not get so fixated, right? And like, I was right, or I'm a victim or, um, you know, like it's the teacher's fault. You can all imagine children that are like this. 
Um, they're less aware of what's happening around them. Uh, we really know that those kids are stuck in the bottom of the ladder nervous system wise um, to the middle. And we need to continue to send those signals of safety to the top of that brain, the top of the ladder to that prefrontal cortex to continue to um, develop. Now, something I did kind of put in all one, all of these is um, the physical stress that can happen at birth when we're, I already mentioned, being yanked out of that birth canal, there's trauma to the neck, um, or there's, you know, there's Pitocin or some sort of induction where there's pressure to that brainstem. We need to think about our infants um, when they're out of the womb, just like they are in the womb. We would not treat a baby the way that we do during the birth process out of the womb. We wouldn't, you know, force them manually to do something um, like we, we do with um, Pitocin. We wouldn't yank them out or pull on their neck or head. We protect them, right? The, the body needs to be safe and protected. And that birth process can truly, truly be a huge key into damage to that brain stem that once again, will damage the thought process, damage the emotions. And I'm using damage pretty dramatically, but really alter, I should say, and put them in adaptive state until it becomes more maladaptive where you're like, man, we aren't stuck in fight or flight. Why are we, you know, feeling like we're constantly overwhelmed? We're constantly emotionally dysregulated. Um, those are a lot of what we start to, to see inside the body. And, and at that point, they need the nervous system to be calm. They need the body to be calm. So what we'll do is, we'll, okay, let's give them counseling. That's, you know, like, let's talk them through this. But 80%, if you remember, is from the nervous system and from the body. So you can't talk them out of it. Sometimes that even just re-triggers that you're like, okay, let's do play therapy. Let's do, you know, something that helps them feel safe um, or cognitive behavioral therapy, where instead, when you start with the body, when you start with the nervous system, with you change the state, you change the reaction, you change the behavior, you change the learning, you change the internal environment, which changes their perception, the external environment, which changes their perception and their communication between other nervous systems and between other people socially and emotionally, and then internally in themselves, where they feel better about themselves. They feel like they're powerful. They don't have to force things. They don't have to feel bad or shameful and what's going on um, inside of their, their nervous system. Then I'd also mentioned that this midbrain is most susceptible to emotional stress. So when we are stuck there, that emotional stress is going to keep overwhelming the system. And then we did talk about um, chemical toxins and our cortical um, brain is really sensitive to chemical and oxidative stress within um, the body. And I already mentioned what a subluxation was and how we get stuck right? We're stuck. I've already mentioned that um, several times, but the wiring of our children will start to interfere with that development emotionally, physically, um, neurologically within the body or viscerally, I should say with organs and glands and, um, and hormones and just the way that they respond and learn. And there is a, a beautiful child and a beautiful human inside of you, a beautiful child inside of them. And one of our goals is to never let another child be misunderstood. Don't let a kid go through life in this adaptive or maladaptive, you know, form of themselves when you know there's something just so beautiful underneath that surface. And when it comes out, because usually there's moments of it, you know, families are less like, man, how can I just get this prefrontal cortex more engaged? Um, and is showing them safety is a huge part of it that our nervous systems are also okay, you know, coming up and down the ladder to be able to handle those children as well, or our children, you know, I can't even say those children, our children as well. Um, those are the moments that we, we just love and we see their brilliance come out and we're like, we want more of that. Um, and that's really what we're here for is fostering this new generation where they believe in themselves and their nervous systems are, are adaptive to their environment and the stress that's here. They're, they're resilient. They're flexible. They can see others for who they are. They can see themselves for who they are. They can be okay with that. Um, they can be okay with other people and they can set boundaries around people when it's not safe. Um, they can be um, really just comfortable with these God-given talents that they have and who they are, which is so, so cool. And it's so, so brilliant. It's something that I really, really love. Um, so I hope that I covered everything. I know there's a lot of information. I know I went longer than I really wanted to. That was closer to 40 minutes, but I wanted you guys to be able to start to understand the nervous system a little bit more and to start to understand, um, the wiring and how the body reacts, but then also how the body can heal, which is for us, 
the most amazing part and the most amazing thing when families come to us and be like, oh, I, I just cannot believe how much this has impacted our family and our lives and all the things that we've tried, you know, trying to cover up the symptoms or address the symptoms rather than address the source and the body. And it's cool. It's cool to see people in their brilliant brilliance. It's cool to see the parents that can then even, you know, as, they, as they're getting adjusted, feel more regulated or be okay, like regulated here, but more at the top of the um, pyramid with their lid on to be like, I can now handle this more to bring them out of it and through the ladder um, as well. And the capacity increases. I've got a, another workshop on October 10th, which is in about a month, what I'm really excited about. We're going to talk about this even further um, or in, and examine a few other areas. We're going to look a little bit closer at birth and really help us discover more about this nervous system and more about how birth intervention does play into it. We can also have ancestral trauma. I didn't, I, I said I could put, potentially mention that, but how that can play into it and how um, protective mechanisms in our ancestors will show up down the line, which is wild. And they've done, you know, studies in rats where they're exposed to a certain stress and their offspring are all have that stress response even though they never experienced that certain stress. So one of it was like a cherry blossom and they got shocked on the foot and um, just the one, you know, parent rats were exposed to it, but then they could find uh, offspring to have olfactory receptors for that cherry blossom and a stress response when they have it, even though it meant nothing to them. So cool things, cool things to look at. I want you guys to register for that workshop. It's in person on October 10th. I mean, won't be able to record that one just because I'll be live and I don't really have the, um, facility or the, um, the equipment to be able to do that, but please join us there, um, and, or get on some of our other webinars to discover more about the nervous system. Talk to you soon.